Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today I have a special guest. I normally I do these solo episodes by myself, but I'm not alone today. I have Corey Everett with me, who is one of the coaches that works with me. Corey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, I know this is so much fun. So we thought it would be fun, Corey and I thought it would be fun to have a conversation about perfectionism because that's just something that comes up a lot in coaching when kids are hard on themselves when they, you know, they want to draw a horse that looks like a horse and they they can't they can't do it. It doesn't look like a horse and or they're, you know, working on their letters and they scribble it out and scrumple up the paper and throw it on the floor. And Corey was just telling me, well, tell me what Big C says sometimes. Well, I've just noticed this brand new since school started that sometimes when my eldest son makes a mistake, he'll just be like, I'm the worst. Yeah, they get <laughs> they get pretty dramatic about it, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, and it's so hard because like they don't have the perspective that we have. And, um, you know, part of, I think part of helping kids with perfectionism is really cultivating that growth mindset, which we talked about in episode 69 with Sheena. So if anyone, we're not going to really go into that today. So if anyone wants to hear more about growth mindset and they didn't, didn't hear that episode yet, that's a really good one to go back to. But growth mindset is all about perspective and I can't do it yet. And about, you know, not having that fixed mindset of, of having to be able to do everything perfectly right away. So that's something that I think definitely we need to remember. But what we wanted to talk about today was sort of some more specific things that we can actually add into our parenting practice to help kids with perfectionism. And, you know, I think that one of those things is that we need to watch our own reactions to our kids' mistakes. Corey, what do you what do you think about when you, you know, see parents on the playground or or at your lower moments? Have you ever gotten really exasperated and upset or seen other parents getting exasperated when their kids make mistakes? Absolutely. It's funny because most of the time I'm pretty good when they make big mistakes at staying calm. But I know that it's when my resource, my resources are low, all of a sudden somebody, you know, spills milk everywhere and it just does feel a bit like an emergency. Yeah, for sure. And it and I think also if if we think that the mistake could have been avoided, it's, you know, it's a it's hard to stay calm sometimes. My mom actually shared something in the Facebook group. I don't know if you saw that. It was a a kid, somebody had overheard like the kid spilled something at the store. And that that somebody overheard the dad talking to the kid and was saying like, hey, you know, these things happen and let's just get something and wipe it up. And, you know, what a beautiful example that was of of really responding that it's not an emergency when your kid messes up. But I think we have to remember that our voices become their internal voices. Yes, that's that's so important. And this is something I think about a lot, Sarah, because you always use the example of you have these three amazing teenagers. So you've seen how it works when you consciously make these decisions. But I really notice that, you know, my my six-year-old is already modeling back that language that he hears. So most of the time I am able to show up in a, this is okay, everyone spills the milk sometimes, let's clean it up. And then I hear him doing that to himself when he does it. And I hear him doing that when my four-year-old does things like that. So People think you have to wait a long time, but you actually very early can start to hear them modeling it back to you if you're making a real effort with this. I love that. And I just want to go back to what you said about when your resources are low, it's harder to stay calm. And like so many things that we do in peaceful parenting, it comes back to us, right? And how our resources are if we're tired or stressed or whatever. So we have to give ourselves a big dose of self-compassion if we if we don't respond well when kids mess up. But I think just having that intention of like really trying to model that, you know, everybody makes mistakes. How can we fix it? Let's do a repair, you know, let's clean up the milk or whatever it is. And and remembering that 
that if we don't want them to be perfectionists and be really hard on themselves, they're going to hear our voices inside their heads when they mess up. That's right. And can you tell that milk gets spilled a lot at my house? (laughs) (laughs) It's so funny. We didn't really, um, my kids weren't big milk drinkers. So luckily it was more water that got spilled at our house. (laughs) It's a lot easier to clean up. I think this is because I noticed for myself that the time when I really have to work hard to be a peaceful parent is first thing in the morning. And that's when my children are always having cereal and wanting to pour milk by themselves Mm, into the bowl. Yeah. Oh, it can be so hard sometimes. So, you know, I was thinking in getting ready for this episode, I was thinking about what are some things that we can do to help kids not be perfectionistic. And I remember one time I was listening to Brene Brown talking about perfectionism. And she said, if you think that you can be a perfectionist and not have your children be perfect- perfectionist, you have another thing coming. She said, if, you're, if you don't work on your own perfectionism, I remember this was a funny way she said it. You might as well just line your children up and put those little straight jackets of perfectionism on them because there's no way that you can be a perfectionist and not expect that your children are going to be perfectionists. So I think really, truly working on our own, I'm worthy and lovable, even though I, you know, messed up and yelled at my kids or I'm worthy and lovable, even though I, you know, tried really hard at this and it didn't work out or whatever. So you were telling me before that something that you do actually out loud with your kids. Yes. So I I learned from you that a big part of peaceful parenting is not about actually like actively teaching our children skills. It's about modeling them to them. So I've been working so hard to just take all these things that normally would be inside my head and say them out loud. So I'm always, you know, the second I mess up, I'm like, even though I just... All I can think about is spilling milk right now. We had a big milk spill on the weekend. (laughs) Even though I just dumped milk all over the table, I'm still worthy and lovable. And I actually make sure, too, to say that those exact lines to my kids, that even though you just made that mistake, you're still worthy and lovable. So they're hearing me say it to them and to myself. I love that. I think it's so important also that sometimes I see parents like they make things up to use as an examples. And I don't really think we should do that. Like, you know, making mistakes on purpose or like, oops, I did this thing. I think, I think that kids can see through that. Like, I think that we, we really need to genuinely be honest. Of course, nothing that's going to be upsetting to them or, or that's not, you know, child appropriate, but but we can share those little mistakes, like, you know, turning the wrong way and getting lost or, you know, whatever those small things are. But I, I, I think we need to find a balance between actually sharing real things that aren't too big and not, you know, finding ways to mess up because they're going to see through that. Well, and I mean, we make so many mistakes. We don't need to make them up. Yeah, true. <laughs> I, I was telling you that the place that I model mistake making the most is actually in the car. This probably says a lot about me that a lot of mistakes are made in the car because A, we always realize the second we're driving somewhere that we have forgotten something. And B, I am always making wrong turns. So it gives me so many opportunities to be like, oops, made a mistake. That's all right. I'm still worthy and lovable. Just going to turn this car around and we'll keep on going. And so, so yeah, the car is actually my favorite place for mistake sharing because you can always guarantee that I will get lost and have to just keep loving myself through it. Yeah. You know, I, I had this big, um, I actually thought maybe I'd write a blog post about this sometime, but I think that also being able to just leave things imperfectly is something that we can model too, like what's good enough, right? And my daughter made me this little sign, like an inspirational quote, like she made on one of those dollar store canvases, right? And it, and she, <laughs> the quote is, do what you believe in, author unknown. She made this like little thing, but she made two spelling mistakes, actually just one big spelling mistake, two, no, two spelling mistakes. I'm looking at it right now. And when she realized it, she just had a chuckle and she gave it to me anyways. And I think I know when I was a kid, if I had done that, I would have been so filled with shame that I would have just taken it back and like been so embarrassed that I had like made this thing and made these mistakes in it. So I think that that's another big part of modeling perfectionism is, oh, well, this is not, it's not my best work ever, but maybe, you know, drawing a picture and, and letting it stand. But she just was like, she just kind of shrugged. And, and that was a moment of like, oh, I think I'm doing a good job that she yeah, that didn't feel like it had to be perfect in order. And it's still in my office. She made it for me like two years ago. And 
And I know when I was her age, if I, if I had done that, I would have A, destroyed it. And if my mom didn't let me destroy it, every time I saw it, I would have been embarrassed. Yeah, that's so true. I try and do this even with not trying to fix things that my kids do. So I noticed that this weekend where we were folding a lot of laundry together and the way they fold it is is not perfect. And the recovering perfectionist inside of me is just like wants to just take that and refold it. And I just was like, no, this is good enough. And just leaving it like that. It's just those little moments throughout our day. That's a good point. That's such a good point. Leaving the imperfect things there, being okay with good enough and not having everything have to be perfect. I love that so much. And I think it's also has to do with, you know, in peaceful parenting, we try to be uh, unconditional in terms of like you're worthy and lovable. You know, this phrase that we say all the time, you're worthy, worthy and lovable even though. And I think sometimes in the out in the world, we get really attached to our production like of things. Like we we believe that we are, you know, I might have believed I I was this sign that I made, right? If I were a kid and I made this inspirational quote. And I think that having that separation between who you are as a person, you're always worthy and lovable and and what you do right? I know in the membership, we have the um, that's thing that we always say, which is you're not your Caesar salad. And that came from my daughter feeling upset that people didn't like the Caesar salad that she brought to school, or they, they did like it, but they didn't vote it the best thing that was brought in or something like that. And I just said to her, you know what, darling, you are not your Caesar salad. And I think that's something that we have to remember, like you are not the sign that you made. You are not the perfectly folded pile of laundry. You are not getting there without any wrong turns, like we have to separate out who we are as worthy and lovable from what we do or what we produce. Yeah, that's so true. And that really, I mean, as a recovering perfectionist, even hearing you say that, it's still something that I have to work on believing. Mm -hmm. What has been helpful for you? And, and, you know, as we said, one of the things we have to do to help our kids is do our own inner work. What's been helpful for, for you in doing that inner work? Well, I actually think it was the mistake challenge. And this is a recent thing that's really changed things around. Right. Can I tell, tell everyone us, about yeah, the mistake? Tell us about that. And that was something we did in the membership when we were doing the growth mindset month. It's funny. Um, we keep talking about that month because I think I told you that might be my, one of my favorite months in the membership that we've had because Sheena was amazing. And this challenge, whoa, it really challenged me. Okay. So tell about the mistake challenge. You and I worked together to get resources ready for the membership. And so I was making out um, like a little cheat sheet with this challenge. And as I typed it out, it was making me sweat. And it was <laughs> it was literally just each day you need to share mistakes, or, you know, around the dinner table that everyone in the family has made. And I was like, I do not want to do this. And sharing your own mistakes, let's be clear. We're not pointing yes. out other people's mistakes. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I was like, I do not want to do this. I do not want to share my mistakes every night at dinner. And that's how I knew I really needed to do the challenge. So uh, I introduced it to my family and it was a bit of a slow start because that's kind of what they asked me. They're like, well, did you notice any of my mistakes? And I'm like, that's not the point of this. The point is for us to notice throughout the day any mistakes that we make, and then we can share them at dinner and we can realize that we're all human and we all make mistakes. What kind of mistakes did you all share? Well, we started looking for them throughout the day. And then that's actually where the magic happened because any time a mistake happened, of course it was milk spilling, but it was beyond milk spilling. It was also just things like I was working on a coloring sheet and accidentally got outside of the lines was, you know, one of my sons was grabbed a toy out of the other son's hands instead of, you know, asking for it or waiting for their turn. And normally in those moments, it would turn into, you know, a big scene, but instead we'd all stop and go, hey, we found a mistake. And I think that's what was so magical about it is that instead of a mistake happening in that instant feeling of like shame or triggering, you know, your fight, flight or freeze instinct, instead we got excited because it meant we had something to share that night. So that I think is what was really the shift. And I'll confess, we no longer share them at night, but we still do that during the day. You know, I'll make a wrong turn and the kids will cheer in the background and say, hey, that's your mistake of the day. So I think that was just such a positive thing is in the moment, it is making us realize that a mistake is nothing to have this shame spiral about. So what you're doing is normalizing imperfection. Absolutely. Yes. Like it's it's something we all experience. There's nothing wrong with it. We don't need to 
feel that sense of shame of I'm a horrible person because I just did this. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's great. I wish that I had done that when my, I don't, you know, I don't think my kids have real actually I can tell you right now, none of them are perfectionists, which is great. I don't know how how that happened exactly, but <laughs> I guess I guess it's through peaceful parenting. Um and me working on my own perfectionism because I I too am a recovering perfectionist and I remember that uncomfortable feeling of, you know, my perfectionism triggers were always around making, you know, well, making mistakes and being wrong about things. And my husband and I would get into these like giant fights where I was saying like that I was, you know, wasn't wrong about this thing. And we we once had a two day fight over what color a shirt was, that it was purple <laughs> or gray. I'm not joking. Like, like he said it was, he said it was purple. I said it was gray and neither of us could let it go. This was a long time. This is probably 15 years ago, but that kind of silly stuff of just like that feeling of like, having another person think you're wrong or being wrong was so shame inducing for me. And I think it was because when I was growing up, I got so much positive attention and feedback for being smart. And being wrong is like the opposite of being smart, right? At least in my brain, it's not It's not really. But that was the, the dichotomy that, that I had set up for myself or that was set up for me. And so I actively worked on every time I was wrong, or even if my husband thought I was wrong and I wasn't wrong, <laughs> Sometimes that would happen too. And I, I had to learn to let it go instead of continuing to fight about to get him to see my point of view, right? To see that, like, yes. to admit that I wasn't wrong. And so now, and it, it doesn't come up very much anymore, but what I would do is just have this, you know, even though I'm wrong about this thing, I'm still worthy and lovable. And you talk about sweating and I would feel super uncomfortable. Like I would feel like, like almost like you could physically, if you can see me right now, I've got my hand on my chest because I would feel this like tightness in my chest. Of like panic almost like, no, I can't be wrong. And like, no, you're wrong and you're still worthy and lovable. But it is, it's really a lot of work to overcome those things. So when I was feeling that uncomfortable feeling, you know, I'd breathe through it and you're still worthy and love. I'm still worthy and lovable even though. And that's part of that welcoming feelings work that we do in peaceful parenting, right? Like welcoming those hard feelings. And I guess that's the last thing maybe we should talk a little bit about. And it could be a podcast episode in itself about welcoming feelings. But we just need to remember that when our kids are, you know, that I'm the worst or, you know, this horse doesn't look like a horse at all. It looks like a dog or whatever, whatever it is. You know, I think we can remember that it, that sitting there with our child and that in those feelings is really important and not trying to talk them out of it. I mean, of course, you don't want to say to Big C, yeah, you are the worst or you don't want to say to your kid like that's a, that you're right. That's a horrible picture. So we're, so we're not empathizing in that way, but we're just recognizing that it is really hard to have those big feelings like, ah, oh, this isn't how you wanted it to turn out, right? And and just our staying calm helps them learn that those feelings are not an emergency. And that's how they learn to tolerate the difficult feelings. Well, and one thing that we've kind of done around this too is, I think I, I learned this from you once again in that growth mindset month is that it's this idea that we're not going to be good at everything right away. Yes. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. That's just the normal way it works of learning to do a new skill. Mm -hmm. So really, once again, normalizing that painful, yucky feeling that you get when you're trying something new. And you get to decide, is this something that I want to put all the effort into to become good at? Or is this something that like, I'm okay, not really working that hard at and never being that great at. And it's kind of helping to distinguish between those two feelings. Totally. Yeah. I remember one of my kids one time came home from school when he was in like early elementary school and said he was bad at soccer. And I said, well, is soccer important to you? And he thought about it for a minute because I was all prepared to like, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to practice and we're going to you know do all these things. And he was like, no it's not really important to me. And and just that helped him like determine like, is this something? And Lynn Lyons talked about that in one of our podcast episodes of like, when it's time to like, you know, really like put all your effort into it and work as hard as you can. And when it's time not to do that, it's some, it's takes some perspective and, and life experience sometimes that kids don't have to know about that. That's true. And I found that after we're done welcoming feelings at a, at a later time, you can also have interesting conversations for reminding them. I think I learned this from Lynn as well about times where it was hard at first, but they kept trying and they got there eventually. So mm-hmm. we've had to do this uh, recently with my son about swimming. 
because it was so hard for him at first, but it was something he decided he wanted to get good at. And he's just worked so hard at it and he's come so far. So when he's having those perfectionist feelings, once we've welcomed feelings and kind of moved through that, I can remind him that when he does decide to really work at something, he is able to get better at it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. and this reminds me of another important thing about perfectionism is teaching my family the line, practice makes better. Oh, I love that. So because that whole practice makes perfect is just not attainable. We're never going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. So that was something that we've been working on too, is we remind ourselves that just because we work hard at something doesn't mean we might will eventually be amazing or perfect at it. It just means that we can get better. Yes. Yeah. And that's great to have that perspective shift that we're not trying for perfect. Yeah. And and I think, you know, when you were talking about that it takes a lot of work to be good at things, again, kids don't have that perspective. Like my kids would be like, why are your pictures so good? I guess that's where a lot of our our challenges showed up as we did a lot of drawing and art when my kids were little. And I would say, I've been drawing for 35 years. <laughs> like, you know, I I didn't start out being a being good at drawing. And, you know, we also would pull out the modern art you know, art books that we had and, and talk about expression. And I used to say to them, if you want it to look exactly like the thing, just take a picture of it. So, I mean, that's very art specific, but I think there are probably in lots of areas where you can sort of draw on real life examples, looking at how, you know, perfectionism isn't our goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we've given parents a lot to work on here. So thank you for coming on and chatting about perfectionism with me. Thank you for having me back. I love chatting with you on the podcast. And maybe uh, we can invite folks to join our Facebook group and share with us some of their perfectionism struggles or their, or their wins where they're, they're making progress against their, their anti-perfectionism progress. And our, that's so if you want to join our Facebook group, it's called Peaceful Parenting with Sarah Rosen Sweet. And you can attest to that. It's a great supportive group. It is a remarkable corner of the internet. It's definitely a really unique space where um, it's just such a welcoming environment and there's, you know, very little drama in there. It's really just a lot of parents supporting each other and meeting everyone where they're at. And you can see how much support each person who asks a question gets. Yeah. And it's great if you're just learning about peaceful parenting or if you, you know, consider yourself pretty well seasoned, but you don't know anyone else who's doing it because it can feel lonely when you're parenting in a way that your friends aren't or your sister's not or whatever. So we hope to see you all in there. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can, sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.